But I've also been around long enough to know that the, the fundamental thing that we do is make certain that we get the right information to the right professional at the right time to make decisions, and that, that information has to be trusted. I like to say that we've been in the big data business long before it was referred to as big data, and anyone ever heard of it before. Um, about 20 years after Dewey invented the decimal system, John West uh, invented the West key numbering system for the U.S. law, and uh, uh, one of the first practical professional applications of metadata was launched, and we're still using it today. And I would also say that that fundamental underlying metadata, when now matched with, with what AI can add on top of it, uh, is truly still some special sauce stuff. And I've never been more excited uh, about the potential that technology holds to transform our business than I am today. You know, I've lived through uh, our organization, I think, being very successful at not being beyond the bleeding edge of technology, but staying on the leading edge, and specifically figuring out how to apply technological innovation to the problems that our customers had. We were the first to go from print to CD-ROM, from CD-ROM uh, to deployed databases, to delivery over the internet, to federated search of multiple of those databases. And in each and every step, it changed the way we did business, it changed what we were able to deliver to our, to our clients, and it changed really the value proposition that we brought to bear. I have to say, that I believe, after our last couple of years of, of experimentation, um, that we are on the crux of the greatest innovation and technological change that we will have seen across that period. That the potential of cognitive computing, AI, deep learning, uh, is indeed profound and will shape the way we do business today. Already in its application, what we see is a world in which we now process every single day the volume of data that just a decade ago we processed in a month. If you think about our global real-time networks, we connect about 4,000 trading floors around the world in real time and process 2.5 million price updates per second today. And if you think about the way not only that we ingest data and the speed at which we do it, it's not just adding more needles to the haystack. It is connecting them in ways that we could not have connected them before. I know there's a lot of breathless uh, uh, discussion this day, these days about machines uh, replacing people. And I'm sure we'll have some questions and answers about that uh, in the upcoming session. And I don't know exactly what that future looks like, but I do think machine learning today certainly will change the way people work and the types of tasks that all of us do. It's already taking place in our organization today. And I would just encourage everyone to engage in the dialogue today. I don't think anyone has answers as to what the ultimate outcome will be. I know my decision has been that we must be involved with this technology, we must experiment with it, and we must innovate with it. And that's why over the last couple of years we have opened a series and network of labs from Zurich to Cape Town and all points in between. That's why we've established a center for AI and cognitive computing here in Toronto uh, to make certain uh, that we're in touch with the latest trends and that we're innovating alongside you and with you, our customers, because the technology in and of itself is a powerful tool, but it's only effective if we apply it to your real world problems. So all of our initiatives start and end with client problems, but boy oh boy, is it exciting today to be able to apply the latest technological innovation to those problems. I'm looking forward to a very, very exciting day today, and there is absolutely no better way uh, than to kick that off uh, than, than with, I've heard the father of AI, the godfather of cognitive computing, of deep learning. I'm not sure which title applies, um, but certainly um, one of our first guests uh, is at the center of one of the most exciting technological innovations in the world today. 
and uh, he's going to be interviewed uh, by our own global technology editor, uh, Jonathan Weber. Jonathan, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Jeff Hinton will be, uh, will be out here in just a second. Um, and so I'm just going to offer a few uh, prelim preliminary remarks. Um, uh, one being that it is really an extraordinary honor to have Jeff Hinton here. He is, um, uh, was you know, slightly modestly described as the founder, uh, pioneer of AI in Canada. But really, even more than that, he's really truly one of the, uh, the true pioneers and the giants in the field. So. Uh, that, is a, that is a great privilege. Um, he he uh, has another, uh, I don't know if you'd call it an achievement, but it sort of explains a little bit the uh, stage set up here, is that he told me that he has not actually sat down uh, in a chair since 2005. Uh, maybe some kind of world record for uh, standing up, but he has a... Uh, he has a herniated disc, uh, which prevents him from sitting down. So he'll be uh, he'll be standing here while uh, while we talk. Um, now, you know, AI, and this is you know part of what we'll get into in the beginning of this discussion. A AI uh, means a lot of different things uh, to different people these days. It's it's thrown around a lot uh, as what could really be thought of as a, as a marketing term uh, as much as anything. And so that's that's how we're going to start out the conversation here. Uh, and first of all, uh, welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, Jeff was also, he noted to me, uh, uh, recently named, just to give you a, a sense of both his own uh, personal importance in the field and, and the importance of this field in general, uh, that Jeff was named one of the 50 most influential people in the world, uh, which is quite a, quite a statement, actually. So uh, congratulations. Uh, now, just to, to start out, um, as I was just saying, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the, these are terms that, that get thrown around a lot, especially these days. It's often hard to discern what they really mean. I mean, computer, computing by itself is, is, can be thought of as a form of AI. So what, what, is the, what is the definition of artificial intelligence? So the definition is doing things that would make a person seem intelligent if a person did them. Um, but that doesn't get you very far. Um, what happened was about 60 years ago, there were two schools of thought. There was a clash between two paradigms for how to make an intelligent system. So one paradigm was logic. So if I give you some true premises and some valid rules of inference, you can derive some true conclusions. And the people who believed in logic thought that's the way the mind must work. And somehow the mind is using some funny kind of logic that can cope with the fact that sometimes you discover things you believe were false. Normal logic has problems with that. And so one paradigm said, um, we have these symbolic expressions in our head and we have rules to manipulate them. And the essence of intelligence is reasoning and it works by moving around symbols and symbolic expressions. There was a completely different paradigm that wasn't called artificial intelligence, it was called neural networks that said, we know about an intelligent system, it's the brain. And the way that works is you have lots of little processes with lots of connections between them, about 10 to the 14 connections between them, and you change the strength of the connections, and that's how you learn things. So they thought the essence of intelligence was learning, and in particular, how you change the connection strengths so that your neural network will do new things. And they would argue that everything you know comes from changing those connection strengths, and those connection strengths change have to somehow be driven by data. You're not programmed. You somehow absorb information from data. Well, for 60 years, this battle has gone on. And fortunately, I can tell you recently it was won, and the neural nets was the right approach. <laughs> so uh, when, when was the battle won? What, what, was the, what was the tipping point? When did people realize that, this, that the neural net approach was a fundamentally better one than a, a sort of a logic approach? And so I guess in about 2009, people doing neural nets showed that you could make a better speech recognizer. And that quickly got taken up by the big companies. And in the Android in 2012 was the first system to complete all the engineering to put that into a system. And when speech recognizers on your cell phone got a lot better, 
in 2012, that was neural nets. So that was one sign. Another sign was in 2012, people made neural nets much better at recognizing objects and images. So now in Google, you can upload your photos and it'll tell you what's in them. You say, find me a photo of a hug, and it'll recognize a hug. And a hug is quite a complicated thing. Or jewelry, it'll recognize jewelry. And a small glittery thing isn't necessarily jewelry. But if you see a small glittery thing and then a woman's neck, that's jewelry. Um, and so neural nets are able to cope with all that kind of stuff. And you can't do it with rules. There's too many rules to write. You just have to learn it from data. And in that case, you'd have a big labeled data set of lots of images and labels that say what's in them, and you train your neural net. And until about 2012, people hadn't been able to train really big neural nets on millions of images. And when we first did that, we suddenly got much better results than computer vision, standard computer vision. And the whole field of computer vision flipped between 2012 and 2013. In back 2011, if you submitted a paper about neural nets, it would be sort of more or less automatically rejected. And by 2013, if you submitted a paper that wasn't about neural nets, it would be more or less automatically rejected. So <laughs> it was a complete so, flip so because it, it worked so much better. And, and you referred to this going back 60 years. I mean, so, so this has been going on for 60 years, and then suddenly, in one year, the whole thing flips over. I mean, what, what was that about? I guess paradigm clashes are like that. Mm. Um, suddenly, there was enough evidence that neural networks really would work really well, given a lot of compute power and a lot of data. And at that point, for example, 10,000 smart Chinese graduate students go into the field. And we've been laboring away with kind of only a few hundred people really working at this stuff. Suddenly, you get this big infusion of very smart young people who um, push the field forwards. And that's what's happening now. Mm -hmm. There was one other thing I didn't mention, which was machine translation. So if ever there was a problem where the symbolic approach was going to win, it was machine translation. Because what comes in is a string of symbols, and what comes out is a string of symbols. And there's all these linguists all over the place who will tell you how to manipulate symbols. They'll tell you what the rules are for how you find structure in strings of symbols that are language. And so that was, the, that was what I think of as the final battle. If symbolic AI was ever going to win, it was going to be for machine translation. If you ask how Google does translation now, what you do is you take in words in one language, you break them up into 32,000 different fragments, which are things like ing, but also all the common words like the. Um, and then you produce the other language, and it's done by a great big neural network, and the neural network has no hand-wired knowledge in it. It just takes these 32,000 alternative fragments, a string of those, and it produces 32,000 alternative fragments in the output language, and it's just trained to do it from data. And if you ask how many linguists did you need to do that, well, you needed lots of linguists to prepare the data and understand that there are different languages and things like that. But how many linguists were involved in actually creating the network? None. You didn't need any linguists at all. You didn't need any prior knowledge. It was just all learned from data. What you needed was a lot of data. So what, what does that look like? when you say, you know, you need a lot of data. What, so you what need does that mean? millions and millions of pairs of a sentence in one language and a good translation in the other language. Mm -hmm. And you take your neural network and you feed it the sentence in the first language. Um, then initially it has random weights and it'll produce garbage in the second language. That is, what it'll produce at each time is a sort of probabilities of what the next word might have been in the new language. Let's suppose we're doing English to French. You give it an English sentence, it'll then produce probabilities for the first word of the French sentence. You pick one of those words according to those probabilities and say, OK, suppose that was the first word, what do you think the second word is? And it'll give you probabilities. You pick one of those, you say, OK, suppose that was the second word, what do you think the third word is? And it'll produce garbage because you put random weights in. And then what you do is you say, OK, you thought the first word was la, and actually the first word was la, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and make you think there's higher probability for la and less probability for la. So you inject an error signal that tells it, you know, got, you got that wrong, you were betting on la and it should be la. And so what we do is we inject an error signal, and that error signal goes backwards through all the connections in the network, figuring out how to change those connections. So next time, it'll say whichever I said, la rather than la. Um, and you just keep doing that. 
It's as dumb as that. You just keep doing that for actually billions of times, and eventually it starts producing good strings in the other language. What's more, you make one net that will translate all pairs of languages. You well, give it a language, you tell it what the output language should be, and it'll produce in the output language. Just one net. So what was the specific story of how, uh, how this kind of machine translation went from your laboratory to the Android phone? Okay, the machine translation wasn't done in my lab. That was done at the University of Montreal and at Google. But the speech recognition and the object recognition were first done in my lab. And in 2009, we got a speech recognizer working. And it worked slightly better than the existing technology. But our one was done by two graduate students working over a summer. And the existing technology was the result of 30 years of hard work. And so it was very obvious that if you developed our system, it would get much better, which it did. And so my graduate students went off to the various big labs, to IBM and to Microsoft and to Google. And all those labs then switched to doing speech recognition using neural nets. Google was by far the fastest to actually do the engineering to get it into production. That's what Google does really well. Um, it eventually came out in Siri and things, because IBM helps with the speech recognition for Siri. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> for the speech recognition, I was very impressed by how fast Google did the engineering. Mm -hmm. So what are, for, for, what are some of the most important applications for this when it comes to financial services? I mean, I know it's a, it's a kind of a, that, that's probably a very long list, but if you could give us a couple of examples of where this technology has really, really had a big impact on the financial system, and, and, and when you look over the horizon a little bit, what do you think are the big problems that could be solved with these technologies? Okay, so I know about how you get a network of simulated neurons to change the connection strengths to work better. I, all I know about finance is each time I look at my bank account, the monthly fees have gone up. Um, <laughs> I do have a former student who knows a lot about finance. He's the CEO of a company called Renaissance, which is a rather successful hedge fund. And he tells me... That would be Bob Mercer, right? No, no, that would be Peter Brown. Okay. There's two, guy, there's two guys. There's Peter Brown and this is evil twin Bob Mercer. Um, <laughs> and Peter Brown's a very nice guy. Um, <laughs> Everything I know about finance, I learned from him, and I don't know much. <laughs> so I probably should refrain from telling you how this is going to be used in finance, but I can tell you something much more general. Any time you have a lot of data and you want to predict something, neural nets are now a very good way to do it. They work better than the alternative technologies at present. So all you need is lots and lots of data and lots of information about what the right answer is, which might just be what happened next. Um, and you'll be able to train a big neural net to do really well. Of course, I actually, I know a tiny bit more than that about finance. I was actually once the technical guy on a little mutual fund um, for Nesbitt Burns um, that worked extremely well. We had a neural net in the 90s that um, it was actually, there was a neural net that decided what sort of phase of the market you're in, and there was another neural net that told you which stocks would do better than the market in six months' time. And so it bought things and held them for six months. Um, and it, it actually performed extremely well. It performed extremely well. A small fraction of that was because it worked, and a bigger fraction of that was because we were lucky. Um, <laughs> and then it stopped working well because the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund copied it and started running a large amount of money, so it took all the signal out of the market. Um, but back then, it was very clear that the main issue in finance in, for example, predicting which are good stocks to pick, is noise. So there isn't enough data, there wasn't enough data then to um, be able to tell for sure what was signal and what was noise. And protecting yourself against thinking that noise is signal was really important. As you get more data, that becomes less important and it gets, becomes more important to be able to see structure in the data when it's complicated structure. Back in the 90s, you could only find simple structure because the data sets weren't big enough. Now, as data sets get bigger, you're going to be able to find more and more complex structure. And I guess one thing I can say that's generally useful is that, suppose I give you a great big data set and there's lots of complicated structure, and you know for all these examples what the right answer should be, historically, 
Um, can you find rules that will predict the right answer? And basically the answer is no, you can't. What's going to go on in a big data set is there's going to be millions of weak regularities. Now, among those millions of weak regularities, hundreds of thousands will be due to the fact that you got that particular sample of data. And if you try and generalize those to the future, it won't work. Um, if you get another sample, even from the same data set, you'll get different regularities. They're what's called sampling error. Just the particular quirks of the particular examples you got. And your big neural net will model all those quirks. And a statistician will tell you that's a complete disaster. And it is a complete disaster. Um, unless your big neural net has also modeled lots of other weak regularities that are really there. And given a data set, you can't tell the difference between regularities that are there as quirks of the sampling and regularities that are real. And so what a statistician will tell you is have a strong threshold so you won't be confused by regularities that aren't real. You won't accept a regularity until there's enough evidence for it. But that means you can't use all these weak regularities. A much better way is to find gazillions of weak regularities and just pray that the ones that are true will outweigh the ones that are spurious and to do with your limited data set. And that's what these big neural nets are doing now, particularly in areas like healthcare, where you're trying to predict medical things. Um, you're really, really grabbing gazillions of regularities and hoping the correct ones will overwhelm the incorrect ones rather than being a sort of uptight statistician who says, I'm going to have a significance threshold for a rule, and I'm not going to accept any rule unless it meets this significance threshold. So in something like predicting, you know, you're talking about the power of, of, of prediction from these systems, right? And obviously in finance, you want to predict future prices. But, but to the extent that one can predict prices, that affects the, the prices, right? So, yeah. I mean, it, 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 so is it a logical goal to think like, well, I can develop a, a neural network system that will be able, enable me to predict future prices better than the other guy? I mean, is that a, a realistic way to think about it? Temporarily, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think back in the 60s, I don't know much about finance, like I said, but I think back in the 60s, people started using linear models in finance and they really cleaned up. Peter Brown told me that anyway. Um, they really cleaned up because they were using a more powerful tool than what other people were using. And by the end of the 60s, or sometime around then, um, linear models wouldn't buy you anything anymore. You had to go into more complicated models. In fact, in the mid-90s, we came up with a model called Gaussian processes that I'm not going to try and explain to you because it's complicated, but it's a very good way of protecting yourself against mistaking noise for signal. And the mutual fund I was man managing for Nesbitt Burns, or giving the technical input to, um, we showed that if you use Gaussian processes, you could actually make it work much better. Instead of being, getting it right, predictions right sort of 51.5% of the time, it would get the predictions right 53% of the time, which for noisy data was much better and allowed you to make much more money. But it turned out Nesbitt Bernburg wasn't really interested in that because I couldn't explain how Gaussian processes worked. Um, I still can't explain how they work. And so they couldn't sell this mutual funds. So one thing I discovered about the financial industry was um, banks don't care whether the mutual fund works. They care whether they can sell it to people. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you raise a very interesting point there, which is that these, these technologies and what you do them are, are sort of fundamentally not explainable, right? So so the, the, the neural net is kind of doing something in there and coming out with a conclusion, but you don't, you don't know how it generated that result, right? Yeah. And so that, so I think you suggested that that uh, opaque quality made it hard to sell because you couldn't really explain to people what the methodology was. And it seems like that would also, uh, in various contexts, uh, raise a lot of regulatory issues where, you know, you, if you, you can't really tell the regulator why you're doing what you're doing. It's just, well, the box said we should do that. I mean, yeah, we, is, is that going to be an issue? Yeah, it's going to be a big issue, particularly in Europe where they want to legislate this kind of thing. Um, we're in this paradoxical situation that we don't know how our brains work, right? So if, if I ask, why did you decide to ask me that question rather than some other question? You could make up a story. You could say, you know, because it seemed relevant at the time, 
And I can say, but why did it seem relevant at the time? And you would then sort of fish around. And your story would be about as plausible as a story by a press secretary trying to explain why somebody said some crazy thing. Um, <laughs> you'd be making it up to try and justify it, but you don't really know why it happened. So we're currently willing to accept people's opinions, even though we have no idea why they said that. Um, and we're not willing to accept neural nets opinions when we also have no idea why they said that. We're going to have to move to understanding that you have a choice. You can have something that's absorbed a lot of information and is using lots of weak rules and using the consensus of all these weak regularities it's discovered to come to a conclusion where you can't justify the conclusion in terms of nice simple rules. Those are the systems that are going to work best. But if you don't want that, you can have a system that doesn't work nearly as well that uses a decision tree or something, that uses nice clear rules, that's fine. You can have your system with clear rules, but it just won't work as well. Because in reality, the only way to make a good decision in a big, messy world is to be sensitive to a gazillion regularities and take the consensus of what they imply. And you're never going to be able to give a simple explanation of that. The simplest explanation of the neural net that does machine translation, for example, is, well, it's got these billion connection strengths in, and if you run these 32 fragments through these billion connection strengths, that's what comes out. So you, you know it works, but you don't know why it works. Yeah, and you yeah. never will know why it works. That's not quite true, because you can train a neural net to behave like a press secretary. You can train neural nets to say why they worked, and it'll be about as reliable as people, maybe a bit more reliable than people. Um, and so we already do that for images. So you can train a neural net to recognize things in images. And if you ask, yeah, but what's the neural net seeing? So you take the neural net that was classifying the images, and you hook it up to the second half of a machine translation system. So instead of putting in an English sentence, you put in an image, and out comes an English sentence. Sorry, instead of putting in a French sentence, you put in an image. And then out will come an English sentence that describes the image. And so now you've got a neural net, and you, are, and you can ask it, what do you see? And it'll say, I see a close-up of a baby holding a stuffed animal. And that's as good as you can do. And that is what it sees. Um, and that's the neural net did that. And so we, if you want to explain a neural net, get another neural net to explain it. But don't necessarily believe that's what's really going on. So that's fascinating. So, you know, the... Um one of the great fears this, this raises, right, is that, you know, you've got these machines kind of doing their own thing, essentially, without us really knowing what they're doing or how exactly. Um, does that raise any other kinds of concerns? I mean, without getting into the more apocalyptic scenarios of, you know, how the computer locking you out of your spaceship, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I, is, is it completely ridiculous to worry about those kinds of things? No, it's not ridiculous, but I think we're going to have to treat it the same as we do with people. Um, if I get in a taxi and I want to know, is this taxi driver going to kill me? Um, <laughs> basically what I do is I don't, I don't ask for a printout of what's going on inside the taxi driver's head. Um, I don't ask the taxi driver what rules he's using. I just look at the statistics, and all my friends get in taxes, and most of them are still alive, and I think it's probably a good bet. Similarly, when you get on a plane, you know, you know that because of the whole system at the airlines, the pilot's probably not drunk, and you know it's a good bet that the plane will actually land safely, but you don't derive that conclusion from knowing exactly how the pilot's brain worked. You do that from statistics, and it'll be the same with these AI systems. If you want to know that your driverless car is not going to mow down pedestrians, you just measure how often it mows down pedestrians, preferably in simulation to begin with. <laughs> um, and that's going to give you a much better answer than trying to understand how its vision system works. So you just kind of look at the results as the, as the way of You do what you do for understanding. people. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so, so you don't really, so, so this doesn't, um, you don't think there's a, a risk of things sort of producing kinds of nefarious conclusions, let's say, or, or you know, leading us down a, a dangerous path. You have path. to worry about people manipulating these things. Mm -hmm. So with a big neural net that's discovered lots of weak regularities in the data, you can use a neural net like that for, for recognizing road signs, for example. 
So you just train it up. So when it sees a stop sign, it says stop sign. And when it sees a speed limit sign, it says speed limit sign. And when it sees a school bus sign, it says school bus and stuff like that. Um, but after you've trained it, the question is, can an adversary come along and figure out how to make something that looks just like a stop sign to you, but looks like a no speed limit sign to somebody else, to the neural net? We can't make something that looks just like a stop sign to you and um, looks like a no speed limit sign to another person. But we can make things that look pretty much like a stop sign to a neural net that's been trained. Sorry, pretty much like a stop sign to you and look like some other kind of sign altogether to a trained neural net. Hmm. And that's because we can sort of cash in on what weak regularities is picked up on. And if you're clever, you can make something that a person won't mistake for some other sign, but these neural nets will. So there's a lot of work remains to be done on how to avoid that kind of adversarial attack on these systems. You know, as long as, um, this is a bit of an aside, but since you're bringing up image recognition, stop sign stuff, you know, I, I think a, a lot of question, a big question a lot of people have is around self-driving vehicles and, you know, they're, you know are they a, a sort of a next year thing or a 20 years from now thing? I mean, do, do you have a view on that? I think they're definitely between next year and 20 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can predict the future about five years in advance. And after five years, it's all just crazy. I mean, you've no idea. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pin you down on that one. So five years from now, are we going to have self-driving cars? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say you can predict yes or no. You, you, you get a probability distribution. It's probabilities, yeah, sure, I understand. Um, all right, so what, what do you think, I mean, what should we be looking for? What are the next kind of major things coming out of, in, in terms of actual applications? So we've talked about machine translation, voice recognition, pattern recognition, these things. What, what are some big, really important breakthroughs that we can look for, say, in the next five years uh, out of these technologies? So there's a database called PubMed that has abstracts of medical papers. And if you look in PubMed for the last year um, and you search it with deep learning, you'll discover that there's, there must be about 100 abstracts come out of systems that use deep learning to understand medical images. Um, and everybody in the field understands that the object recognition that these neural nets can do is now good enough so you can make systems that are about as good as doctors and possibly a bit better. So that's true for, for example, if you take an image of your retina called a fundus image and you look to see if you've got um, diabetic retinopathy, there's five stages and now a neural net can do slightly better than a doctor at telling you not quite as good as the best doctors, but slightly better than your average doctor, are telling you, ophthalmologist, are telling you what stage of retin, uh, diabetic retinopathy it is. That's really important because in India, for example, you could stop a lot of people going blind if you could cheaply figure out which ones to treat. And there aren't enough ophthalmologists, but this system is going to, in a few years' time, it's going to be, it's already being field trials and things. Um, it's going to stop a lot of people going blind because it's going to be able to do it fast um, and cheap. And that's going to be true for lots of other medical images. Like when you get old, you wake up one morning and you discover there's this funny patch and you want to know, um, so I go to the doctor and I say, I got this funny patch and I'm fairly sure it wasn't there last week. And the doctor says, uh, Yes, that patch is actually a burn. You must have splattered hot fat on yourself when you were frying something. Say, oh yeah, I remember that. Right. That's embarrassing, right? Um, that's one kind of error. The other kind of error is you have this little black thing that you ignore, and it turns out that was a malignant melanoma, and if you got it a bit sooner, you would have lived. Um, that's the opposite kind of error. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be able to make something on your cell phone, and you just show it this thing, and it tells you what it probably is and whether it's worth taking it to a doctor. And in fact, pretty soon, the cell phone is going to be a lot better than the dermatologist's. It won't be as good as taking a sample of it, putting it on a slide, 
and doing the pathology on the slide, which will also be done by a computer, which is going to be a lot better than the pathologist. Um, that stuff is coming quite quickly. Obviously, there's an enorm enormous commercial incentive for it because medicine is expensive and we'd like to make medicine better and cheaper. Um, I doubt it will make it cheaper. It will just mean we get a lot more treatment and more efficient treatment. Um, at present, the system trained on 130,000 skin lesions is about the same as a dermatologist, slightly better. Um, but it was only trained on 130,000 skin lesions. Once it's been trained on 10 million, it'll be much better than dermatologists. Um, a paper came out last week, for example, of looking at CAT scans of the head, and they're looking for like 30 different things, aneurysms and hematomas and all sorts of things that I don't even know what they mean. Um, the computer system now um, gets a clinically significant error rate of 0.03%, actually 0.037, so 0.04%, and the average doctor who, who's trained, the average board-certified person for looking at these CT scans, gets a clinically significant miss rate of 0.8%. So the computer is 20 times better. That's 20 times less misses than the doctors. What's more, the computer can be fast, and for a lot of these things, if you've got a hematoma or something, you want to diagnose it fast. Now, this is an archive paper, so you can't necessarily believe all the results. And I'm sure the referees will make them modify their claims. Um, but that's just a sign of things to come. And the reason they could get such good results was they put together the results of 29,000 studies so that they get themselves a database of 3.5 million CAT scans. Um, normally, these studies have just a few CAT scans. And that was the crucial thing. The crucial thing was getting big data which you guys know about. Um, once you've got that big data, then you can make systems that have much more experience than any doctor, and therefore would be much better than doctors. One other thing, if I may. Yeah, sure. Um, that's in image analysis where it's dead obvious this is going to happen. I get into trouble with doctors for saying you're all going to be out of work in five years. Um, <laughs> but, so I won't say that. Um, <laughs> that's just radiologists. So, they're not actually going to be out of work. They're going to be able to spend their time with patients explaining what their options are and what this all means, um, which is a much better use for human empathy. Um, so, the other thing that's going to happen is there's a huge amount of data that, about every patient and that, the amount of that data that doctors actually use to decide what to do next, to decide what test, to decide how to treat you, is minuscule. Um, there's your whole genome. Pretty soon that'll be cheap to get. There's your whole medical history. Um, not just the results of tests, but all the things you said when you were talking to a doctor. In among which are all sorts of information that the doctor didn't pick up on. Um, there's, there's your microbiome. There's your epigenome, which is your, how your genome has been messed with by environmental effects. Um, all of that information could lead to much better medical treatment. It could lead to sort of predicting what's going to happen to this patient next fairly reliably and treating it before it does. So things like screening will look very primitive. Um, we'll have the equivalent of screening each person by taking into account all their properties and how that relates to all the other properties of all the other people for whom we know the results. It's going to be hugely better. And that's going to happen, but that's going to be slower. A lot of people realize that now. There's going to be a lot of regulatory issues, like how do you get hold of all this data? Um, but it's very clear that at present, medicine's making almost no use of the data available. And it's going to get much, much better when it uses all this data. Mm. And it's going to be much too much for a person to use, so it's going to have to be computers. Is it, that's, that's a great example, um, uh, very specific. Is there anything uh, in the world of, say, business and finance, similarly, that you could point to with, like, you know, this thing is really going to change in a big way, like we do it this way, and five years from now we're going to do it a totally different way? Uh, most of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, I don't really know much about finance. Anytime you have to predict something, you're going to get better at predicting it. I mean, already things are happening like um, 
big neural networks are reading everybody's tweets to try and figure out um, what this says about whether um, Facebook shares are going to go up or down. Mm -hmm. um, much more of that's that going to happen. Kind of sentiment presumably. analysis. You know, and, and so on that point of you know, Twitter and such, just to shift gears uh, slightly, um, as, as a Google employee, you're certainly uh, very much aware of a lot of the uh, controversies around the role of the internet and fake news and you know, accuracy of information and how it influences elections and all those things. I mean, and generally speaking, I think the, there's a lot of criticism at the moment of, the, of, of Google and Facebook, especially in Twitter, of, of doing sort of a poor job of, of policing for fake news. Um, and other kinds of abuses that happen on these systems. Uh, is, is our neural nets going to be able to help us with that problem? Or are they already helping Google with that problem? Um, neural nets will certainly help with that problem. So one nice example of that is with um, spam. So it used to be that spam was a real problem. Mm -hmm. And neural nets are now very good at detecting spam. Also. The other day I got this very plausible thing saying I owed money to the university and I failed to pay this request for payment from the university and could I just click on this to find out what the payment should be and I almost fell for it so I, in fact I did fall for it so it was from my university it was from a plausible account and I thought oh dear I must have just missed that so I clicked on it and Gmail said, do you really want to open this link? Um, it's, it's a highly suspicious link. Um, and so you right. got that and warning. Then I looked and I realized, yeah, I was stupid to click on that. Mm -hmm. um, it was clearly trying to get information out of me. Mm -hmm. um, so neural nets are going to be very good at providing a sort of envelope of protection against these things. Mm -hmm. what, um, what do you see as the kind of philosophical implications of, of neural nets. In other words, how do, you know, if you look even out, you know, beyond where we can predict, you know, how do they kind of change the society, change the, the culture, change the conception of self even? Yeah. Um, I think, um, well, one thing that's obviously going to happen, if we're right about this approach to making intelligent systems, and it is related to how the brain works, we're going to understand a lot more about how the brain works, which is going to be better for fixing brains that have gone wrong, and it's also going to be better for things like education. Um, but something even more important, it's going to change our understanding of the nature of what we are. That's why I'm in this field. I want to understand sort of how brains work and what we are. And the conception 50 years ago was that we're rational beings and we do reasoning and what's inside our heads, these thoughts inside your head are big symbolic expressions. And I think that's pretty much nonsense. There was something that happened about 100 years ago where the concept of people as rational beings was sort of undermined somewhat by Freud, who pointed out that there's um, all these unconscious goings on. Most of them are to do with sex, but that's not the main point here. <laughs> the main point is that we, most of the reasoning we do is not conscious, deliberate reasoning. Um, Freud said there's unconscious reasoning. I wouldn't call it unconscious. I'd just say we are devices that work by using analogies. And that's much more basic to how we work than reasoning. And I'll give you one piece of evidence for that. Um, you know from biology that there must be male cats and female cats, and male dogs and female dogs. Otherwise, they'd all be gone by now. Um, but if I say to you, um, I'm going to give you a forced choice. And the forced choice is, um, you have to decide which of these two is more true. All cats are female and all dogs are male, or all cats are male and all dogs are female. Well, at least in our culture, everybody knows the answer to that. Cats are female and dogs are male. And little kids know that right away. Um, they don't even notice there's a logical problem there. That's clearly not logical reasoning. That's something about the fact that you're, inside your brain, when you think of a cat, there's a huge vector of features. There's lots and lots of active neurons that represent different features of cats. And also when you think of a woman and when you think of a man, there's lots and lots of features. 
And it turns out the big feature vector for cat is closer to woman and the big feature than it is to man, and the big feature vector for dog is closer to man than it is to woman. And that's because these features come from experiencing these things in the real world, and big, stupid, loud dogs chase small, smart, discreet cats. That's the way it works. Um, that's not a political statement, that's just how... It, uh, so, that kind of understanding of the world is the primary understanding we have. And it's not logical. Um, we, we absorb information from data. From this data, to explain the data, we get concepts, which are huge vectors of features. And if you do that with a neural net, if you train a neural net, for example, to predict the next word in a sentence, and the way it works is it first turns each word symbol into a vector. It learns to do that, such that these vectors are good at predicting what vectors will come next. And then you look at these vectors, you discover that without you telling it how to do analogical reasoning, it can automatically do analogical reasoning. So what you do is you take the vector that is extracted for king, and you take the vector that is extracted for male, and you actually subtract the two vectors. This is vector algebra. So you take this big bunch of numbers that represents king, and another big bunch of numbers that represents male, and you subtract the numbers for male from the numbers for king. And then you take the big bunch of numbers that represents female, and you add those numbers to what you've got left. And so now you've got king minus male plus female, and you look at the numbers you've got left, and hey presto, you've got a big vector that's very close to queen. In other words, it knows that king minus male plus female is queen. And it learned that just from modeling which word comes next in strings of words. Similarly, if you take Paris and you subtract France, and you add on Italy, you get Rome. This kind of automatic analogy is how these systems work. Logic is something that comes much later on top of these systems. It doesn't happen until far, far later. This is happening in two, two and three-year-olds. Logic is happening later. Um, that's really the essence of how we work. And it's very like Freud's idea of the unconscious. Um, that there's all these inferences that you're making without thinking you're making inferences. They just happen automatically. Um, and if you want to understand how to manipulate politics, you need to understand that's how people work. That's fascinating. So I, you know, I have a uh, final question because we're, we're about out of time here. But um, you know, these things you describe are very, very powerful and, and obviously extremely important. And I think one, one thing that people wonder is, like, is all of this ultimately just going to reside, all this kind of power, really, and, and knowledge uh, going to reside in, in a few big companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, where all your students are now running these programs. But, I mean, these companies are so giant and so powerful and seem to be so far ahead of most in... in having the capability to really advance these technologies. So is, is that going to be the case that, that really will be reliant on, you know, the big five companies to sort of develop and hand down, you know, these, these technologies? Or, or so is it going to evolve differently than that? I can't speak for the other companies, but what's happening at Google is they've developed this very advanced software for um, creating these neural net models. And they've also developed very fast chips for making the models run really fast. And they're putting all, they made the software public, and they're putting all that on the cloud. So what's going to happen is um, people will be using a lot of Google cloud services, but what will be available on the cloud is the same technology as Google has. And in fact, even within Google, there's so many applications that it's hard to get people to design all these neural networks. So we now have neural networks designing neural networks. And those neural networks that design neural networks will be available on the cloud. So if you're, a, if you're a medium-sized company that has lots of data, suppose you're a small supermarket chain, mm. you've got a lot of data, you'd like to predict what special offers will suck in the right customers um, who will then spend lots on perfume or whatever. Um, you'd like to model your data. You don't want to have your whole in-house team of neural net experts that aren't enough to go around. Um, you'll be able to use the software and use the neural nets for designing neural nets in the cloud so that the, the ability to model data this way is going to be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Of course, Google would like you to use the Google Cloud, but 
I'm sure Microsoft would like to use the Microsoft Cloud. So we'll, we'll kind of have neural networks as a utility? Yeah. Uh, that anyone can use? Yeah. Okay, well that, that's really fascinating. Well, we are out of time now, and I uh, want to thank you very much for an outstanding uh, presentation. <laughs>